Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This week, uh, I know I said I was going to cover Newcastle Helix, but I got a bit sidetracked this week and I decided to look into something else. As you probably know from a few of the videos I've made, one of the major interests of mine is like modernist. So I'm going to go down the route of that for today's video. When it comes to big modern estates, within the city centre of Newcastle really is only two or three. But if you go across the river to Gateshead, it's a place that really just tried to radically redesign the whole town centre in the 1960s and 70s. And that led to some just fascinating ideas, but also some very uh, poor quality housing that was thrown up very quickly. One of these particular projects that is often notorious for uh, its short lifespan is St Cuthbert's Village. This is obviously a modernist estate that's located between the King Edward Railway Bridge and Windmill Hills. So Windmill Hills has a bit of a long history within uh, Gateshead and this was, hence the name, always a place where windmills were placed on top of the hill. The Tyne Valley steeps very very sharply up this part of Gateshead, um, taller than anything in, on Newcastle side for a considerable distance. So, as you can imagine, it's windy up there, so it'd be a great place to put your windmill and um, grind flour or whatever they want to do with it. Following on from this, Victorian era streets were built in this area, and this sat aside Askew Road. The last windmill on Windmill Hills closed actually in 1890, and in this area after that was just Victorian terrace housing, something like you'd find in the likes of uh, Heaton or Jesmond or anywhere else in Gateshead that has this sort of uh, gridiron layout housing. This gridiron housing based around back lanes and of some Tyneside flats and that sort of thing it was outdated and they sort of was backward. A lot of these properties didn't have uh, indoor toilets, running water. The consensus at the time was they need to clear up housing and the way they saw this was rather than sort of an ad hoc process of modernising housing, it was more of let's rip down the streets, let's tear everything down, and then let's just start. A scheme was devised, and this was um, started in 1967, and the scheme was completed in 1969. The main contractor for this scheme was Stanley Miller. Uh, the scheme costed £3.5 million and was to provide 3,500 homes within it. So the estate design actually consisted of 39 low and medium rise concrete uh, blocks. These were linked by concrete walkways, and the focal point of this was a 17-storey tower block, or sometimes known as point blocks. So this whole idea of concrete walkways in the sky was another sort of one of these modernism in planning ideas of sort of separating pedestrians entirely from traffic and allowing them to sort of flow over. So I think you'll see this sort of thing if you watch my Newcastle upon Time motorways video or anything similar like that. So the state also gained some fame, um, once complete, actually featured in Get Carter. It's Glenda's flat in this, and uh, it's a drug baron's flat featuring in uh, Get Carter. But now to sort of the downfall of the estate. So I'll show you some photos of it, and I'll sort of show you the overall design. But it was these streets in the sky, a large number of point blocks. It's what you wouldn't be shocked seeing in sort of a Eastern European country. However, as with many similar modernist estates, there were actually some issues to this. So the actually a lack of facilities in the area, because of course they cleared the complete area that most likely had shops and all the facilities already and they didn't rebuild these in time. So when people moved in, they often lacked a lot of the local facilities they wanted, say pubs, say corner shops. So there was a real lack of these facilities within it. There was issues with the crime and the poor design. With often a lot of people saying that the walkways um, and dark enclosed spaces these created actually led to sort of an increase in uh, crime. There were social issues with destroying and relocating tenants. Uh, a survey said 85% of people of residents actually wanted to move out at one point. I think any time you're demolishing in a large amount of housing and rebuilding to try and improve in some way, one of the things that's not often considered is the social mix of these places and the social connections that exist with sort of next door neighbours and these sort of things take time to formulate and communities to form. 
whereas just wiping a clean slate just doesn't allow that to happen at all. Another major issue with the flats were they apparently costed Gateshead Council a thousand pound a year to maintain, whereas the average sort of borough to maintain was £424, so this extra cost was obviously a factor in Gateshead's decision to remove them. So, and also these sort of late 60s high-rise and modernist sort of point blocks all fell out of public favour. Um, I think they can really turn this round to Ronan Point when there was a gas boiler explosion in one of these high-rise flats. Public opinion really went back to, oh, I want a terrace house, I want to be on the street, I want to know my neighbours, rather than these big, in a way, dehumanising estates, because you can't really know your neighbours. Whilst the Stanley Miller block um, was demolished, another, a large number of them actually still remain. So, Harlow Green, Aladdin, Beacon Lower Estate, Regent Court, Jesmond Vale House and Shieldfield House are all constructed by Stanley Miller. So this sort of shows, whilst there are issues with this estate, some of the buildings they made are still standing in the test of time. So it is more of an issue of maintenance and upkeep on these buildings, more so than their complete failure. But it should be noted that a lot of these remaining estates aren't ones with walkways in the sky. They're a lot more grounded. Um, say Jesmond Vale House and Shieldville House are just standard point blocks, they're just towers within a sort of normal residential setting rather than um, walkways in the sky. So what replaced this you might be thinking? Because this offers one of the most unique viewpoints over the, across Newcastle because as I said you're on the sort of the peak of the Tyne Valley and you're really looking across the whole of Newcastle so you have really just nothing stopping your view at all. So it's a really commanding position. The idea that St Cuthbert's village really had was being this sort of dense environment to sort of simulate Newcastle on the other side, weighed up to the position it held, whereas what's replaced it now is a privately built Simon Holmes estate and this now occupies just only half the site that was originally taken. The point block tower uh, still remains and this has been reclad so it doesn't have such a concrete appeal, I think it's got some sort of like brick slips on the side of it. But back to Simon estate, it seems fairly a uh, normal persimmon estate and there's nothing wrong with the homes built here. They seem fairly nice and they've got Juliet balconies overlooking this view. But it's a fact, this is probably one of the most commanding views you can really have in the whole of Gateshead. And just the views it has of Newcastle is incredible and I think this position really deserves to be an icon of a building. And it's a shame that the Gateshead housing market just couldn't provide this and instead all we got was a two to three storey persimmon estate which means it doesn't really hold the position it should do. There is still a public park here, so you can go up and uh, sort of experience this view. But the best parts of this view, I think, are actually the glimpse views you get through from the Persimmon Homes estate, because there's less foliage, etc., blocking the view of Newcastle. Persimmon Homes replaced it, but the site wasn't demolished until 1994. I will include some of the footage of a walk it did on what remains on the actual site. So as, as I said, the point block still remains and the Persimmon estate exists. They're just fairly bog standard. Connecting this, connecting the estate originally from one half to the other across Askew Road, which Askew Road, I believe it's at 50 miles an hour, but it runs like a motorway through the site. So rather than having pedestrians cross at a lower point, they obviously went for the elevated walkways in the sky. And you have an elevated walkway across the uh, Askew Road leading into the site. This concrete walkway still remains and still there to this day, a bit overgrown. And you can sort of see at the end of this walkway there's three dead ends which have been infilled later with a railing. And to me, this I think this must have been where the original walkways in the sky would have spanned off from, this bridge connecting to the rest of the homes in the estate. This part of the site is completely abandoned still and it just forms sort of wasteland, scrubland and isn't used at all. I think there's some aspirations for the site. Let's have a look at the recent plan permissions for this area. The recent planning history is that Gateshead District Energy Scheme is now proposed to go through the site. This was submitted in uh, 2021. So it shows there's ambition to make the lower part of the site really quite sustainable by connecting into the district energy based up at the Baltic Business Park. And in 2019, there was a, an approved permission in principle. Uh, this was for 140 to 190 homes, uh, with one or more of the following. They're gonna have a hotel or an assembly and leisure use or offices of roughly 1,600 square meters. 
As this is only for permission in principle, there's no um, real plans for this scheme. It's more of just Gateshead testing the waters of what would be allowed here. So obviously the technical details of anything involving the scheme, whether this will be an office block, hotel, or a leisure use, still needs to be confirmed in sort of a later planning application. But it shows that Gateshead would approve of another housing estate on this area. So they have three years from 2020 to submit this. And it's interesting to know this wasn't a private, uh, this wasn't a private sector investment. I believe Gateshead Council still own the land and Gateshead Council were the one to submit the planning permission. But even though they're the council and they own the land, they still have to go through the planning process to sort of get the site through.